We are here officially with our first guest for the bedroom and beyond, Miss Dr. Lovely, Miss Fiona Lovely, that I know her as, but everyone else in the world will know you as Dr. Lovely and we'll, we'll never forget. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it's so funny because I call people lovely all the time. So I'm literally talking to you day and night. So Miss Lovely, Dr. Lovely, as it were, what is it that you do? Tell the world. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks. Thanks for this opportunity to come speak to you. I'm really excited about it. So I am a women's health care uh, professional and advocate. Um, I have uh, specialties in functional medicine, functional neurology, which means I fix broken brains. And I talk to women about their hormones and uh, I specialize as well in restorative endocrinology. Big words that just mean I have a cool little piece of information here and there to share with women. I love working with women in the menopause transition. And so that's the midlife hormonal transition. And um, uh, my sweet spot is talking about um, neuroplastic therapies and hormones and the divine feminine. Ooh, and that's exactly <laughs> where we cross over in the divine feminine. <laughs> so this is a very juicy conversation. I love it. Well, thank you so much for coming on and expressing all of your goodies because these are things that we're not really taught and know about on the ready. So this is actually very beneficial. Um, so midlife is, I think you believe you said 35 to 45 is the range, which announced to me, I didn't know that. <laughs> I'm like, I'm pushing 34 over here and I'm like, oh, I'm coming up to this. So this is a good thing to pay attention to. Yeah. And, and, and our society has not in recent years done a great job of educating women about what happens at the perimenopausal transition. And that's ultimately what we're talking about. And that can start 35 to 45. In fact, the average age is around 40 for women to start the um, egress of hormones. So it's something we need to be prepared for and um, mm, doesn't happen nearly as much as I'd like to see it happen. Let's put it that way. I would have to agree. Uh, I'm not in the medical side of things, but definitely when I'm talking about divine feminine energy and we're talking more things around intimacy and connection, people kind of just, they glaze over a little bit being like, should, should I know this? So this is a, actually a beautiful opportunity. So I'm very excited. Um, yeah. So for me, um, my name is Dana. So forever who doesn't know me and hasn't really watched my channel yet, <laughs> let's start there. Um, so I'm a tantric practitioner. Uh, I basically combine spirituality with your sexuality and how to find divine connection within yourself. And that can help with obviously intimate times with self or partner, but also just overall life, having a more enjoyable and blissful time how to say yes to you more readily than not, because we're not quite there yet of being very good at that. So <laughs> ladies, I'm speaking to y'all. And yeah, so my mission is really to allow people to feel into their body, get real connected, and just live a life that they love, really. And it's, it's really cool that there's all these other little things that go into it, so I'm um, very interested about the hormones and the hormonal talk. Um, so Fiona, whatever you have for us, I am taking the notes. I am ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it's one of those things where we can get better educated about it. And what I'm loving is that the younger generation, so I'm well in my perimenopause at this point, um, haven't yet hit 50, but closer and closer all the time. And what uh, is stand, stood the test of time. And I have been practicing for almost 20 years. And um, what I have seen from women in that time is that 
my generation is not getting any and we're the ones going through the 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 thick of the perimenopausal transition perimenopause and menopause transition are interchangeable just there's a lot of confusing language so let's just clarify that but um we're getting more informed and what's really interesting is our daughters are asking way better questions than we did Mm. my nieces are asking way better questions than I did. And so I believe things are turning and things are changing. And um, as I was saying to my class, I was teaching this morning, because my generation, that's the generation X, we aren't prepared to stay quiet. We were not raised to stay quiet. We were raised to be women with voice, for the most part. And so because of that, many women in my generation are driving the research on how we can do better with this time of hormonal change. And um, thank the sweet Lord, because I should say, thank the goddess, thank the goddess, because the (laughs) the truth is that we need uh, better solutions. We need better answers. And for so many women uh, before me, my mother's generation, my grandmother's generation, um, the answer was, if they thought to even ask the questions on how to feel better, they were told it's a normal part of life, get used to it. Can you imagine being told a man being told that? Um, (laughs) Right? Or, uh, yeah, or this is just how it's going to be for the rest of your life. So women are driving the research, which is really good. So what happens? When we reach the age of 35 to 45, what women start to notice first is that they cannot elevate their moods the way they used to. Maybe their sleep starts to change. Maybe they are fatigued and nobody has an answer for them or they haven't thought to ask the question about what's wrong with me. So once these things start to happen, we know we're kind of at the early stages of perimenopause. Now, for the most part, intimacy and connection with a partner or even unpartnered, what's the proper terminology there, Dana? (laughs) Unpartnered. um, Solo? Partner versus solo, yeah? Or individual self, yeah. Just okay, okay. Self-love or partner love. Okay, very good, very good. Connection. So, um, like like I said, we're learning. <laughs> yes. I, don't, I also want to be politically correct here because there are things that we're not supposed to say. So, I would say individual is safe. Okay, okay. Um, so, it starts to change in terms of... Um, connection to our libido, Mm -hmm. our sex drive, where we've got that up and down that happens every month. This is for women because of the hormones. They come in, they come out, whether it's estrogen or progesterone. Um, And we start to feel uh, with that exhaustion that maybe that's not, that's the thing that can kind of go to the side, right? So as we deepen into perimenopause, women can start to experience things like dryness or painful intercourse if we're talking um, a partner and um, even if we're not really, to be honest. Um, And the way we connect changes. And part of that is hormonal. And part of that is simply a matter of we get to turn our resources inward as all this push and pull of estrogen and progesterone, which you don't even realize that's happening until you start to get into the later parts of perimenopause and things get kind of quiet. And then you're like, well, where's Auntie Flo? (laughs) Where'd she go? Well, what section of my, for me, I follow my cycle right? in terms of when I know to do which projects I know which days to rest. I know which days not to work out or not to do my intermittent fasting based on my cycle. So the few cycles that I've had where she's been really late, like not the scary late, but the, the, are you ever coming again late? (laughs) It's like, what happens? Now, what's really interesting about women when we stop cycling is we don't have that ingress egress of progesterone and and, uh, estrogen, but the hormones that are produced by the brain, that is FSH and LH, go high and they stay high. What does that mean? That's the stuff that releases the eggs at the ovary. Mm-hmm. So I know what that means is you get in a creative space and you stay there. Yes. 
So you don't have that push and pull. And I, I, I love the, the idea of that. I'm not personally there yet, but I have many patients and many friends that are, and they say, there is something so lovely about just having your own experience and you're not being controlled by whatever your hormones are telling you to do, which the hormones teach us to, to look outwards. Yeah. Right. Anyways, there's a whole lot in there. <laughs> That's lovely though. To Thank have you. a dedicated creative space and just like, whoa. Yeah. Like that's amazing because I actually am very similar to you where I track my cycle for obvious purposes as well as um, energy levels for exercise. I do the intermittent fasting and it does make a difference. Oh, yeah. so I'll be very curious to know when I start having the symptoms oh, and how that would change for me specifically. Like. Uh, yeah. I could be your poster child coming up in a couple of years here. So just, just, just hold out for me. Okay? Yeah. yeah. No, that's lovely. Well, and you know, part of what happens too is you get the experience of it just being what is. You're not having to manage whatever your hormones are driving you to do, right? Which is a pretty big deal. It's a pretty big deal. So, you know, um, I forgot to mention, I do have a podcast called Not Your Mother's Menopause. Um, just shy of a million downloads on that over the years. Woo! I've been doing that podcast. Yeah. And, and actually, when I started the podcast, I was there was one other podcast on menopause. So it was me and one other person. And um, really, for me, I wanted to disseminate the information as best as I could, because for me, science and knowledge free my mind. It allows me to play in a space. And um, with that, one second. I must text my husband and tell him the cat is scratching at the carpet. <laughs> we're, we're having a little scratchy noise happening here. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <clears throat> okay sorry all right don't be better, i love better. this it's real life <laughs> this is real. let's go it's like this is real life. <laughs> this is real life you don't just pause live because the cat's scratching at the door you know like <laughs> they know right <laughs> no it's lovely i like it okay yes so anyways, back to business. A woman in your age group, just a little bit older, starting to have symptoms is so terribly misunderstood by the medical profession that she is most often at the age of like 36, 37, 38, is more likely to be misdiagnosed with chronic fatigue or and or fibromyalgia than any other time in her life. This is how medicine treats women, okay? Now, this is not to speak ill of medicine. Medicine is just in their own space. And the truth is, menopause doesn't fit in there really well. They haven't had to answer these questions. So, you know, ultimately... If I can get information out to women younger and younger to prepare for this time, then I've done my job well. It's not just about the women in my age group and the ones that are older than me. It's about looking at all of us and saying, how well are we as the elders, as the wise ones, as the older sisters, telling the younger ones how to take care of themselves? For example, this week, I had um, a couple of crappy nights sleep earlier this week, and I was feeling pretty, um, pretty worn out. On the other hand, so if that kind of thing happens, I would typically um, stay home. However, uh, because I have patients, and that's a lot of work to reschedule them, and people are depending on me, I was not contagious with anything. And so I thought, okay, I actually need people around me. That's part of my healing. So I chose to go into the office, but I said to my admin staff, I said, please, the gaps that are on my schedule today, nothing funky, nothing weird, like <laughs> no weird things, just regular people who can nourish me as much as I'm giving to them. And then I finished off that conversation by, by saying they're all in their late 20s. I said, ladies, perimenopause is a bitch. Prepare yourself now. And I was surprised that a, all of them, with the exception of just a couple, said, how do we do that, Dr. Lovely? 
And I was like, okay, now we're talking. Now we're talking. (laughs) So I'm like, let's order, let's order gluten-free pizza and have it in service. (laughs) Love so free. (laughs) I know, right? So what 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 you can do at this time is really, really pay attention to your stress levels. Now, for most women in their 20s and even in their 30s, you may or may not even be aware of how much you're allowing stress in versus how much of it is habit Mm. and how much of it is actual a stressor that you need to respond to. Ooh, that's good. Yeah. So the stressor that we need to respond to is someone's lost their airway, they're bleeding, or someone's about to have a baby or a heart attack, right? Right. That's a stressor you need to respond to, or your child's unsafe or something, you know, you need to respond to that. But what you do for the other stressors is very important because ultimately that picture will add up to whether or not you have a symptomatic menopause or not. Wow. Yeah. And I guess that's where I come in and say, how do we handle the stress before it gets too stressful? (laughs) And yes. really just asking, I think it's for me at this point in time and a lot of my viewers is like really understanding yourself at the baseline before any of this stuff would ever, ever even happen. So like, what is normal stress for you? What is your baseline? What is your calm? Because it may look different to you than it is it is to me. But you need to know that for yourself because you can't really gauge any changes in your body or or in even in your hormone levels um, and when you really notice it. So I always say, look at self first. See what you're doing or not doing that's contributing to whatever's happening to you. And because my niche is all about intimacy, it's more fun and playful. So... There are ways that don't have to be like, oh, another thing I got to do. It actually gets to be fun. So I just want to insert that so people aren't hearing this like oh, medical things and I got to do what now? No. <laughs> <laughs> but here's something Yeah. Here's something interesting on this topic. I so I get emailed all the time for people that want me to interview them on my podcast. Like they're offering to be a guest on my podcast. And um I got one this week and the the subject title was Masturbate Your Way Through Menopause. Yes, I need <laughs> to listen to this because masturbation is your best friend. <laughs> It helps so many different things. And if it's going to help your menopause, definitely get on that. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, just from a, from a physical or physiological point of view, if you don't use it, you lose it. And that is certainly true. But that doesn't mean you can't get it back. You can always get it back, right? But in terms of, you know, when, when the tissues start to change because the hormones are going up or going down, just depends on where you are in the in the transition. Um, the amount you're actually utilizing your tissues, let's just to make it sort of medicalize it, but the more you use it, the more it, the, the the better things are going to be long term. And this is true for our male partners too, because they go through a male menopause. It's called andropause. Ooh. Yes. And so, you know, and, and, and it's all of the things you've heard about. It's a, you know, a 20 year old girlfriend in a Corvette and a, and a limp dink, <laughs> pardon my French, <laughs> without, without Viagra or whatever you would choose. Right. But it doesn't have to be that way. That's just the stereotype. Right. So men can just do so well and thrive during this time, just like we can, if we embrace it. But I'm very curious about this whole, so it's, it's, a, it's a sex toy company has come together with a body care product company mm-hmm. and they have created uh, skincare for uh, delicate menopausal tissues wow. and sex toys that are, uh, I think, more appropriate for women in menopause. Appropriate is a funny word. Let me, let me restate that. Um, 
more, I think, attractive. Because here's something that happens. My girlfriends and I talk about this all the time. Um, how the way you connect with your partner changes mm. with the egress of hormones. Okay, yes. this And to be real... Yeah, to be real specific about it, it's it's not so much what I refer to clinically as insert insert tab A into slot B, repeat, okay? <laughs> because the truth is, sometimes that's not possible, yeah. whether it's the, the, ma- the male or, or the, and of course, I'm talking about heterosexual couples here, but um, this is it's a matter of a renegotiation. Like we come together as a partner and a partnership and say, okay, what is meaningful to us in our connection? What does intimacy mean for us? And can we drop some of these sort of old beliefs about what it means to have sex? Yeah. And I find a lot, cause like even in my practice, like a lot of couples just, they don't even have a baseline of communication and they just expect or assume and then they're left with, well, they don't actually care. And it's like, it has nothing to do with that. You just haven't expressed yourself in the way that fits you and for them to understand what it is that you need. Because all of our partners, well, most of them, all they want to do is is please you. But if they don't know how to do that, they're just going to assume from what they would want and how they would want to be pleased. And that's kind of how things end up being. So especially if there's changes in the background with all the perimenopause, andropause, all the things, the pause, can we just take a pause on life? Like really? And if we're not talking about it, it's just, it's, yeah. I can imagine how many people would um, just feel at a loss. So again, thank you. Well, and we You're welcome. But we're not taught how to communicate around sex. It doesn't matter if you're 25 or you're 45 or you're 55, right? We are not taught how to communicate around sex. And so a lot of couples will just shut down altogether rather than talk about things. And this is especially true if there is trauma. Mm -hmm. And frankly, who does not have trauma of some kind? in their life. It's a big well, conversation. I know. And it doesn't need to be for people that are not familiar with trauma. There is big T trauma, which would be like an actual traumatic event, like a car crash or something like to that nature. Uh, and then little T trauma is more just like consistent things over time that has traumatized you. And now being an adult, you're like, I operate this way because of I've heard this thing 17 million times and but we don't we don't think about that as trauma so just 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 to clarify and also everyone deals with some form of any of those things so you're not alone (laughs) please know that yeah 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 and it's nothing you did wrong the truth is the trauma for most of us is coming from a capitalistic and patriarchal structure in our society that says human beings are, um, if they're not productive, they're useless, and that we have structures of power over each other. Mm-hmm. And that's a really, really important thing to, to acknowledge because um, it's so easy for us to get into a loop of I caused this somehow and um, which is not not healing we always want to come from a place of love for ourselves first although we're not taught that either right so you know how do you it's amazing we managed to make babies at all really when you think about how much people are traumatized <laughs> But like, again, that's just something that you do. Like, it's just the natural order of things and we figure it out. But like, there's no, again, communication or education around being responsible for your emotions, the hormone part of it, like all of these other things. It's just so fascinating how many different angles really contribute to whether it's a yay or an A. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It was really, you know... This is sort of beside the point, but I was watching last week's Grey's Anatomy. If nobody has seen it, I imagine by the time. Have you seen it? Did no, you see it? don't tell me. 
Okay. All I will say is they talk lots about sex. Okay. And sex education. And what I found most fascinating, and I've been a sex educator for a long time, not in the same way that you are, but more talking to women about reproduction mm -hmm. and uh, pregnancy prevention. Sometimes it's fertility we're talking about. Now, as I get further into my perimenopause, I'm having those conversations a lot less, but I've had them for 20 years in my practice. I am always surprised at what comes up around um, whether it's a 16 year old I'm talking to and they feel like I'm a safe place to ask questions of. I always try to encourage that. Um, or it's um, a woman in her fifties or sixties wondering how she finds pleasure. So, but anyways, back to Grey's Anatomy. Um, what came up, what was really interesting was the conversation around consent now, in my gender, I've been in a, I, my husband and I have been married for almost 20 years. So we don't have to have that conversation. Let's just say it's a trusting, monogamous, respectful relationship. So I imagine if some of those other pieces are not there, you might have to continually have that conversation. But I was watching another medical show this morning while I was uh, eating my breakfast because um, like I, I'm a doctor. I watch all of them. That's how this goes. Of course. You must. This, is, this, is, this is nothing new. <laughs> um, and yes, I can rate my favorites. Uh, but anyways, and they talked the same thing. They mentioned something about consensual sex. And I was like, this is good because this is a reaction to the Me Too movement. This is a reaction to the fact that we're recognizing the trauma. This is a reaction, I think, probably to the reversal of Roe v. Wade in the States, etc. There's a lot of women's issues that are involved here. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on this conversation around consent. I'm so glad you asked. Actually, this is definitely something I cover in my practice. Um, we go more in the sense of intentions and boundaries, uh, only because we're coming from a place of you're never the same person twice. So even though, let's say, you and I were dating, we're going to get jiggy with it later on, and you and I are discussing, let's, let's do the nasty. Time comes, I actually don't feel like it. Something inside of me, whether it's a trigger or just a change in my hormone levels, maybe it's my energy, and I don't say anything, and we, we continue like planned, well... I'm not actually enjoying myself, but you may not know that because we already have it in our minds that we agreed upon it. So it's not necessarily consent itself, but being able to speak up when things change for you and really understand your body, again, self first. And I absolutely believe consent is probably the best thing we can start to adopt as a habit. Uh, not just in intercourse and intimate times, but also just everyday boundaries, you know, like I come from an ex people pleaser. Okay. I used to be like, oh, I'll do anything. I'll do anything. And I felt like a doormat and I was like that for years. And now that I have my power back, I will never again go back there. And when I see people continuously letting themselves be a doormat, I just, you know, it's, it's for me, it's more about empowerment to stand up for yourself. Because mm -hmm. I sometimes feel people will hear the word consent and be like, oh, like I'm doing something wrong or like, you know, more authoritative type of vibes. And that's not exactly what we're saying. It's more in the realm of knowing your value and what you value and what's okay, not okay in a moment's time. Because I may be okay and, and a yes right now, but tomorrow it's like, Something happened that shaped my view differently, and now I'm I, I look at that just just a, just a smidge different. So absolutely, I'm a I'm a consent gal. Um, necessary. necessary, necessary, and um, even just a small example. Me growing up, I was very huggy, like I'm like ah, like I just want to love people. That's just my jam. But not everybody has or wants a hug. So I've adopted the habit, especially with COVID times, to ask people, and that's a consent. It's like, may I give you a hug before actually hugging them? And it's like, yes, or maybe it's a no, and I'm okay with the no. 
I much rather get a no from someone. I'm okay. Thank you. Yeah. Then this like awkward, like, Oh, get away. <laughs> and make yeah. me feel like a different, like, just kind of not like I'm doing something wrong. Yeah. So definitely, definitely consent. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear this conversation is coming up. Um, because it's very, very, very necessary. I recently had uh, a young female in my office um, ask me, actually, this is how it was worded. She said, Dr. Lovely, does the female G-spot exist? Because my religious studies teacher says it doesn't. Okay, so here's my reaction. <laughs> Tell us. The first thing was like, what the fuck is your religious studies teacher doing talking about the goddamn G spot? <laughs> oh man. So, okay, so once I calmed myself down. <laughs> And this is somebody who is still in puberty, so she's quite young, okay? And her mom knows that I am a safe place to discuss things with, and she has given me permission to answer any questions that her daughter might have. Yeah. And so, um, and I kind of, for my patients, I come off as that cool auntie vibe, so, you know, and I'm not afraid to swear with them, et cetera, because it kind of, it encourages a certain kind of connection and they go, okay, well, I can ask her the things I feel like I can't ask my mom or my auntie or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> apparently it came up and this is a Catholic school system. And, um, and so I asked, I said, so what is your sex education in Catholic school? And she said, we are taught to abstain period. And I'm like, I said, you know, that is not realistic, right? And she said, No, I understand. She got it. She got it right away. She's like, my friends and I talk about it. I'm like, okay, good. Because I would rather her learn from this kind of experience than to Google porn and think that that's how human beings interact in a sexual fashion. Sometimes, but not often, I don't think. No, I know. <laughs> well, it isn't in my life, Dana. Oh, <laughs> I mean, I don't think it's anyone's life all okay. the time. Don't right. get me wrong. There is a time and place to get raunchy and with it the way they do on the yeah. screen. But that's not an everyday connective intimacy piece. It's mostly when you're getting paid for it, really. <laughs> right? Like, you can just do whatever you want. You're getting paid for it. I would be like, oh, my God. Like, you know, like, of course. <laughs> I didn't like you broke it. <laughs> I'm a sex educator to sex actor. Let's go. <laughs> Ride it like you own it, right? Always. <laughs> Anyways, so I said to her, I said, okay, first of all, yes, the um the female G spot does exist. And I told her how to find it for herself so that she could do that if she wanted to. Um and uh uh you know <sighs> was not surprised to hear that from her. And I'm, I'm glad she asked. Uh, but it's so interesting how women's pleasure is not typically been part of the equation, but it's changing. Yes. So the clitoris and its anatomy was put into the, yes, exactly, <laughs> was put into the anatomy books in the 90s yes i okay. remember watching a documentary about it and there was actually at some point in time in history in anatomy books there wasn't even the female anatomy listed no no, no. so if we're talking the 1990s that is in my lifetime i mean i was dating in the 19 in the mid to late 1990s i was That's just born yeah, there you Keep go. Going, friends, I was born right on that, that point. Go. We're going to expand yeah. our knowledge. <laughs> there was no discussion of this. We did not talk about the female sexual anatomy. We did not talk about the female pleasure anatomy. Now we do, right? So um, somebody actually just did a study on whether or not um, 
the squirting orgasm for a woman is legit. Did I send you that? Did I send you that document? Not sure. I don't think you did. However, yeah. please yeah. do after this. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would love to hear what you know about this myth, which is not a myth. But... Yeah, no, it's not. Uh, it helps if you know where the G spot is, but that's another guy. <laughs> Just saying. There's a G spot? <laughs> Uh, but anyway, somebody looked at it uh, and studied it to see whether or not it was like where those secretions were coming from. So, oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so we know that now it's in the science, but it's, it's literally been done, I think, sometime in the last year, if I remember correctly. So beside the point, now we can talk about the female pleasure anatomy. And of course, there are more nerve endings in the clitoris than there are in the uh, glands of the penis, the head of the penis. And all babies start out with a clitoris. In some cases, they become uh, a penis, and in a lot of cases, they don't. So um, it's so interesting that the primacy of male pleasure was the standard for the longest time. Now, we can get into conversations about, you know, the patriarchy and the church and that, but the truth is, we could just state it and say, that's over there, and now we get to leave that behind. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and this is actually the exact reason I want to empower women in the more sensuality sector because we can't be fully expressed in this day and age when there's this kind of overarching message that the female anatomy doesn't matter, apparently, and that the female pleasure centers are not really talked about. And it's funny because we actually have more. Mm -hmm. We have, technically we have the same amount of erogenous zones as men do. They're just a little tad different. And the other difference is that we take a little bit longer of time to warm up. And that's where I teach people to slow down. And it's not just this wham, bam, thanks. Yeah. Which would really kind of compass all this, what we're talking about mm -hmm. in the, f you want, Gentlemen, you want to please your ladies first. That's all I got to say. <laughs> if that's all you say, that's the best thing to say. But this becomes even more important at midlife because when the hormones are quieter. Yes, tell us. It takes more time for, because here's what happens. When a woman gets aroused, her vagina elongates and it enlarges. It becomes in, engorged, just like the, the male penis does. Mm. And, and, and with that, this is all the pleasure stuff. So when women talk about dyspareunia or painful intercourse, my question always first is, are you actually ready to go when insertion happens? Because if you are not and Mr. Winky is whamming up against your cervix. That is no bueno. Does <laughs> not nothing. feel good. I don't care how much lube you put on it. There's nothing fun there. Mm -mm. Right. And ladies, please do not be afraid of lube. I, if you need it, you need it, period. Lots of women in reproductive age need it because the menstrual, uh, sorry, the um, birth control pill will actually cause a loss of secretions for a lot of women. A lot of women. So if you need lube, just pick a natural one, please. I like personally, I like uh, all organic olive oil. Just make sure you have a separate bottle for the bedroom. <laughs> a separate bottle for cooking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pubes, pubes in your stir fry is no bueno. No. <laughs> <laughs> no bueno, friends. Oh gosh, yeah. I'm a I'm a lover of either coconut oil or almond oil. It's very nice Ooh. on the the genitalia. So can I can I give you a little bit of information with that? Please do. I used to recommend coconut oil. However, it is antibacterial naturally, which means it will disrupt the microbiome of the vagina. Okay. Yes. It's a great lube, to be honest. It really is. I used it for years, but myself, but uh, I've recently, once we know that antiviral, antibacterial property of uh, coconut oil, we don't want to disrupt the microbiome of the vagina. Really, really important that that stays a nice, healthy garden of Eden down yonder and your olive oil will not disrupt that. Lovely. 
Now you know. And but almond oil, ooh, so good. It smells amazing. The sweet almond oil. Nice. And I heard it's a much better for uh, down there purposes, anyways. I forget the exact reason. However, it doesn't have the antibacterial properties, but it yeah. actually has this. Also, like the lubrication itself is like, it feels almost synthetic. It's very interesting, oh, but yeah. the most natural and glide free. No tugging away. We're good. <laughs> so, is it okay with a condom? don't know the answer Ooh, we need to get back to your listeners we need to get this. back to the <laughs> listeners anyone out there using sweet sweet almond oil with the latex condoms let us know let us know is it good is it not somebody google that please <laughs> somebody google it right <laughs> um i think it's okay because i notice um certain certain lubes that I use in my practice also. So I do something known as the sacred spot massage, which is a prostate massage for men. And that's their other little pleasure center in there. Yeah. Guys, if you haven't tried it, don't fear it. It's amazing. But I often find like the gloves that I use, they just like, they just tear apart. Like it's just, right. it's very interesting. So. And that's um, with a silicone lube probably. Yes. Yeah. Silicon yeah. and latex are no not not good together. I do know that. They are not. So So if you've got if you've got toys that are silicon, you have to use how does that work? If you've got toys that are silicon, you have to use uh, if you've got toys that are latex, you have to use sil uh latex or non non silicon lube, I think is how it works. There we are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like so I was many rules. <laughs> I know all these or if you've got if you've got silicon toys, just use a silicon loop, right? Isn't that how that works? Then you're yeah. okay. Yes, yes, okay. I never have this problem, so I don't really know for a fact <laughs> on personal levels. Yeah. But yeah. very good. <laughs> but you said your latex glove falls apart with the silicon loop. Mm -hmm. So there, there you go. That's there. There is something there. I think the oils are fine, though, Dana. I'm pretty sure, yeah. but um, it's good to check. But coconut oil. This is the updated information. Tell us. Yes, is just coconut oil will disrupt the vaginal microbiome. So use something. Actually, I, I have heard as well that some of the other lubes, uh, KY in particular, not to call anybody out, but I guess I just did. That one will disrupt the microbiome as well. Okay, good. To yeah. Know. And you can use probiotics mm. vaginally. Okay. Okay. So if uh, um, I do recommend this from time to time, this is especially true for women that might have uh, actually works quite well for things like uh, yeast infection or bacterial vaginosis that's being treated. Once yep. it's been treated, you can absolutely use a probiotic. And there are companies that make ovules that you insert very similar to a yeast infection remedy um at bedtime and then you, then you got all the flowers growing all the nice flowers growing <laughs> you wake up exactly birds are twittering and bambi runs by <laughs> cinderella very good exactly. <laughs> oh god that's good you're funny <laughs> well it takes two of us right so yeah I, I hope there's something, something useful here for people because it's a big conversation, really. It is. And again, if there's anything you hear and you want to even niche it down more, we can always have another conversation or I could just go off on a tangent like I do. I'm sure Dr. Fiona Lovely here would also do that on her podcast. So All the time. All the time. <laughs> so there you go. It's like, it wasn't niche down enough. We'll do it next time. <laughs> specifically just on this lube <laughs> <laughs> we're like oh really didn't we didn't we go over the lube conversation and over and over and over again and over and over again <laughs> repeat <laughs> i always just say what works for your body but i also have to train you how to trust your body and muscle test so very good yeah there you go very good time <laughs> oh so many things to think about. It's like, how does anyone want to be intimate now? We're like, there's these things going on, hormones flying out your yin yang, you got lubes now working for you, this and that. It's like, do I even want to be intimate? Yeah. Yes, yes, you do. Why? 
Why do we want to be intimate with self or others? Well, listen, it's good for your brain. One of the, my favorite things to recommend for brain health is uh, three orgasms a week. And here's the response I get most of the time. <gasps> Ooh, I love them. The response is, okay, I don't have the time for that. And I was like, okay, slow your roll. I didn't say anything about bringing in a partner. You can, as far as I'm concerned, get in the shower and rub one out in, in, a, in a short amount of time, right? Now, I guess everybody's different. So you have to give people the opportunity to be different. But the truth is for cardiovascular and brain health, there's few things that are better than an orgasm. Also, I would obtain for um, mental health. Oh, God, yes. That's a good one. Yeah, because you get all the endorphins and all the goodies. One of my favorite nuggets of information to share about the female orgasm, actually about orgasms in general as a brain nerd, is this is a really good window into male psychology versus female psychology. When a man has an orgasm, his entire brain lights up. All the networks light up. When a woman has an orgasm, the brain goes silent. Wow. Isn't that fascinating? It is. It is. Well, folks, you heard it here. The way to get a woman to shut up is have an orgasm. <laughs> Nothing in the brain. Because leading up to the orgasm, are we not thinking about our grocery list beforehand or like yeah. the laundry we need to stack or the things that we need to do? And we're like, duh, 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 duh. and this is the key element of why people actually don't reach orgasm is because they're not present with their body. Oh, that's a big one. So what's your favorite way to teach embodiment for a woman? Oh, personally, me is dancing. Me too. Because, well, I've been a dancer since I was like three years old. Thanks, mom, by the way. I really appreciate that. And it's <laughs> just when you can move to the music and actually not care if people are watching, there's this element of connection to self where you like, you get it. You get your rhythm. Even though it's a rhythm to the music, it's actually the rhythm that's inside of you that's connecting to the music. So if you can do that, you can always find a baseline of connection with anything and anyone. Don't hear that as the, I love my car and I'm going to marry it thing. But, <laughs> you know, people like love inanimate objects, but like I'm saying, <laughs> I'm going to connect to my water bottle right now. Um, <laughs> it's so fluid. It's just about literally what works for you and not caring if it's weird in society because it's your own personal connection people long for connection does it really matter where it comes from no and we're hardwired for connection Yes. i was just teaching this this morning on uh um i teach small group coaching and perimenopause so if women have it's kind of a way for us to come together and share what we know what our knowledge is um certainly i share the science but the ladies are very open and they share their experience and then the others learn from it again women heal in groups this is how we've been doing it for millennia what? so it's, it's true right um so learning to connect with others is such an important thing. And the truth is it's not happening because of the trauma experience for a lot of people. It's not safe to be around other human beings for a lot of people. And so whatever gives you that gap, that moment where you go, okay, I'm okay in this moment. And I'm neuroregulating with another human being. I'm co-regulating experience. Allow yourself the freedom to engage because your brain will be better. Your mental health will be better. Your physical health will be better. All of the things will be better. You'll have less stress, et cetera. And I think, Dana, these things are going to be, become bigger and bigger conversations because we've just come off of three years of isolating from other people and, and one of the, the biggest way we neuroregulate each other is by looking at facial expressions, especially around the mouth and hearing the intonation of the voice. And for a lot of those three years, we were covered up. 
So what is going to be the, and that's not a statement on whether that was the right thing or not, that's past. The conversation is going to be how do we right the wrongs that may have happened in that time around our mental health, around our ability to connect to other people, around our ability to have intimate experiences with another human being. And I think that's a big conversation. And I'm happy to see it it happening. I mean, we're having it here, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Um, Dr. Gabor Mate is talking about these very things as well. He's got a new book out called The Myth of Normal, which is excellent. Everybody who works with human beings needs to read that book, I think. Yes. But (laughs) yeah, it's it's great. It's so good. He's on the book tour right now. He's doing lots of podcasts, et cetera. but, But just being able to safely look at another human being and feel that heart to heart connection that is so healing for us. And we did it naturally, not that long ago. And it's been, it's been really, um, I don't want to, I want to say evolved out of us or programmed out of us, but somehow we've moved away from it. And I think, I think the trauma thing pays plays a pretty big role there but but for another conversation and another day and (laughs) um lots to pull apart there definitely i will definitely want to pull that apart um a side part of what i do for people is i'm also a professional cuddler so there's been a lot of hesitancy when it comes to like arranging a cuddle let's say um just because People are so, they're like, is it is, is this okay? Like, is this actually okay? And it's like, it really wow. is. And it melts my heart when people, like you can feel it in their body. Like I can feel it in their body, that moment in time when everything is relaxed and you're in your parasympathetic state and everything just goes. <sighs> yeah. And that's my, like, that's my indication. I'm like, like cuddling a baby it's like it's so nice it's so nice for me to watch and witness people just like relaxing not the idea of numbing out with tv and other things going on in the life but when they actually relax whether that's in a cuddle or if i'm healing like they just they just they take this guy this beautiful brain and they shut it down so they basically have a female orgasm (laughs) <laughs> that's what i got from today <laughs> no it's good but um i just i love humanity so much and there's just so many so many avenues of connection you know it doesn't have to be physical because i always thought like hugging was my my love language right like physical touch but i actually experienced inside the pandemic i experienced a long distance relationship and we were not physical clearly because it was long distance and borders were closed and you couldn't go anywhere and and it honestly was the best relationship i ever had because i really deeply connected with this being as opposed to just being physical to be physical so even though like you may not have an opportunity if you're sitting at home and like you do things online and that's that's beautiful Don't feel like you can't connect with people, even if it's through a screen, because you really can. And there's people that are longing for that as well. So I just want people to know that um, that's an option always. Yeah, Zoom's really changed the way we uh, operate in the world in FaceTime and all of these other, excuse me, all these other things. Because if we're going on the principles of neuroregulation, you and I are doing it with each other right now. Mm. even though we're across the country from each other. Yes, well. <laughs> For now. For now. <laughs> Till I come punch you down and just start like, being <laughs> beside you all the time. No. <laughs> but um, it's, it's good. It's a good, it's a good thing. It's things we don't think about, you know. We just do, 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 even though we're a human being. That was one of my favorite quotes ever that I learned is that D- you're a human being, you're not a human doing. And that literally changed everything for me. Yeah. So beautiful. You learn it newly. Good stuff. <laughs> well, I am all jazzed up. What did you learn today, Dr. Lovely? Oh man. <clears throat> that that non-physical relationships can be rewarding. 
the best. I got reminded that condoms and silicone lube do not match up. <laughs> Just remember before you get really getting into something. <coughs> ah, poop. <laughs> it's good to have lube options. Let's put it that way. Yes, I have a whole drawer. It's like a tea drawer, but it's a lube. <laughs> Okay, this oh, this perimenopausal lady will stick to her tea drawer. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, God, that's good. Well, <laughs> I've learned so much from you today. Oh, my goodness. Um, just kind of preventative measures, right? Like, just what to look out for. Again, not taught these things, so... Get curious, get informed, and it doesn't mean anything unless you make it, of course, but at least you have a choice. You can powerfully choose from that point instead of just, oh, this is just the way it is. So thank you for giving us possibility today. I love that. You're welcome. Thank you for asking. Thank you for asking me to be here as well. Yay. <laughs> Round of applause. <laughs> beautiful <laughs> i love this so space calm. i know i just i feel so calm even though we're like very jazzed up beings we're just like i feel so in our flow in our element see just go talk with a friend you know yesterday just quickly before we leave i was up in my head about a lot of crap going on and it's normal of course it's human human beings but i was like what's the quickest way i can get out of my head and go talk to a friend go be of service yeah and i'm gonna tell you at first i was like i don't have the space i need someone to listen to me and then all of a sudden i was like wait no what's going on and i cleared my stuff and as soon as i was like in my element of like i know what to say to this being and they were like thank you so much i was like all my other concerns just kind of disappeared so what does that tell you they probably weren't that important yeah, 100%. So, there's a little sign off for you. Rarely are they. Yes. Connection is key. Period. End of sentence. Done. 100%. <laughs> thank you. No problem. Thank you. And thank you all there out in the world. Whoever's watching, viewing, share, like, comment. We want to hear from you because... This is great information, but if it's not hitting you in the right area, we can adjust. It's not a big deal. Yeah, where can, where can people find out more about what you're doing? Um, so the YouTube channel is relatively new, but uh, also on Instagram at unilove underscore academy. Um, so all things intimacy, all things sensuality, how to connect, I also deal with physical ailments for anyone out there in the world that doesn't want to speak of their in the bedroom things that are quote unquote embarrassing. They're not embarrassing. It's a beautiful time to rediscover how to do something. Um, but yeah, Instagram is probably the, the best place. And then from there, I have a website as well. Connect with me, email me, message me. I want to hear from you, definitely. Amazing. And for you, what is your easiest form of contact? The uh, the podcast is called At Not Your Mother's Menopause uh, with Dr. Fiona Lovely, Making Hormones Make Sense, it's called. Um, and I'm on all the platforms. Um, my website is drlovely.com and you can find me on Instagram and TikTok at Dr. Fiona Lovely. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm going to say love that, but I'm like, no, that's... Lovely. <laughs> so amazing. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Truly my pleasure. Thank you for asking. Welcome.